Welcome everyone, I'm County Executive Joe Parisi. As the prevalence of COVID-19 around the U.S. is increasing, so is the understandable concern all of us have for the well-being of our families and our community. Dane County government is actively planning should the need arise for us to adjust operations if community spread of coronavirus occurs. Several weeks ago, when a resident of Dane County tested positive for COVID-19, structures were put in place to ensure collaboration between departments within county government. Public Health Madison, Dane County, Dane County Emergency Management, the Department of Administration, along with 911 and the Sheriff's Office, have all been working closely on planning, preparedness, and response. Public Health is keeping the community informed and is providing regular updates. I also convened county department heads to have them begin the process of updating their continuity of operations plans. Through this process, resources are being identified in case the need to limit non-essential county operations should arise. This could take on many forms, including some limited term need to work from home. We're also actively engaged with our community partners, such as those with us today. We are coordinating efforts, planning for potential scenarios, and working together to share and coordinate resources. The recent news of an additional case of COVID in Dane County is bringing new attention to domestic travel. The individual in question traveled within the United States and fell ill after returning to Dane County. At this time, based on recommendations of public health, we are recommending that Dane County employees do not travel domestically to states with more than 10 cases for any reason. This travel restriction will remain in place until further notice for Dane County employees as we continue to monitor the efficacy of this measure. In short, I understand these measures will impact our workers, but our focus right now is on safety for our workforce and preserving our ability as a county to deliver critical services. In short, we need to protect our ability to respond. Should community spread occur, the demand on public services will be exponentially greater, so we need to do our best to keep people who deliver those services healthy. We are in the process of building a community-wide emergency command center that includes our education organizations, municipalities, public safety, and human services personnel, and equity leaders. I'd also like to note that the Director of Public Health has the power to enact statutory authority to prevent disease spread in the community. Should the spread of COVID-19 escalate, the Director of Public Health has the option to use this authority to order suspension of public events in the area. While we are not at that point yet, it is important for the community to know that this option exists, and we would encourage those who hold public events to start thinking about contingency planning should this occur. We will continue to adhere to guidance from the CDC and Public Health Madison Dane County for future decisions. This is a rapidly evolving situation. We are operating under unprecedented circumstances, and we will work to keep you informed as new details emerge. It is important to remember that our experience of COVID-19 will be a process. It will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We will get through it, and we will get through it together. Because should this virus spread in our community, our approach will be not every person for themselves, but it will be each one of us for each other. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Minor point, I forgot to introduce, um, the mayor is going to speak next. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, County Executive Priesty. Uh, I wanna start by expressing my appreciation to the Department of Public Health, Madison and Dane County for their leadership on this issue, and all of the hospital and healthcare workers and administrators who are working hard every day to understand the science of the virus and to get ahead of the curve so the city and the county can be prepared. Key community partners have been working in very close coordination to prepare Madison and Dane County residents since our first case in February. I know that the public has been very anxious and I wanna thank all of our residents for keeping their heads and responding in calm and appropriate fashion and following the guidance emerging from our public health department. At this point, we are no longer solely focused on the individual cases here in Dane County. We are focused on protecting our entire community. Everyday preventative actions such as frequently washing your hands or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, covering your cough and sneeze with a tissue, and staying home when you are sick are still very important. Current information suggests that more cases will be identified in the United States and that person-to-person -person spread is likely to become more common. Our neighbors in Chicago have announced their first case of community transmission on Sunday. And as we get ready here in Madison and Dane County for the next stage of this virus, 
We want to ask institutions and individuals in our community to give serious consideration to further precautionary steps. We're all going to have to learn to do a signature wave or a bow instead of shaking hands. People who are over 60 years of age or immunocompromised should follow the CDC guidelines and avoid crowds. Employers and institutions should prepare their continuity of operations plans, avoid the spread of the disease by providing telecommuting options, flexible health care policies, and paid sick leave. Families should prepare for possible school closings and should make a plan for where the kids are going to go if child care centers and after school programs are closed. The city is preparing as many of our employees as possible to work from home and we are in the process of issuing guidance about work travel and personal travel for our employees following the county's lead. As we move forward, we may need to limit large gatherings or take other more restrictive measures. These decisions will be made by state and local officials based on CDC guidance, as well as the scope of the outbreak. If you are watching the news, we know that you're worried, but all of our city staff are working hard on this emergency and in coordination with the county and a large group of community partners, including the hospitals that are represented here today. We are focused on protecting our most vulnerable neighbors, and we are planning to maintain core services across our community. We ask that you take care of your own health, make sure your family is prepared, and that you look out for your neighbors. Together, we will get through this. I would like to turn it over now to Dr. Nasius Safdar from UW Health. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nasia Safdar. I think from the health system's perspective, what we have been focusing on is preparedness. Preparedness for every possible scenario to be able to deliver the kind of care that health systems in this city pride themselves on delivering. So the three sort of tenets of our preparedness are that we are coordinating a response to support each other. Uh, if this unfolds as it has unfolded in other states around the country, it is likely that no one entity or one individual can claim full preparedness. But together, as a community, the health systems will come together and be fully prepared to support those who need health care delivery in all kinds of traditional and non-traditional ways. This requires creativity. It requires innovation. And fortunately, our community has always had that in spades. I think from our standpoint in the health system, we are focusing on three things. One is the capacity to be able to care for patients who need care in the health system. And that includes thinking about facilities, thinking about infrastructure, thinking about how to do that in a safe way. The other is to protect the workforce. And what that means is that individuals or employees of the healthcare systems who have symptoms consistent with an acute respiratory illness may be tested in a more expeditious manner such that COVID-19 can be ruled out or whatever condition is prevalent may be ruled in, and therefore we can make plans for adequate staffing should that become necessary. The third thing that I'm sure many of you have seen is that we are all grappling with what are considered to be uh, imminent or down the road shortages of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and others who will need that to take care of sick patients. There are all kinds of plans that are being put in place to be able to do two things. One is conserve the PPE we have and use it in a, in a in the cost effective, efficient manner so that we can reuse things that ordinarily in a non-crisis like situation we would not consider doing, which still promotes the safety of the healthcare workers and allows care delivery. And the other is to support each other and coordinate as much as we can across health systems so that whoever needs something can be free, feel free to ask others for it. We are very committed to this effort and to our patients, and, and we feel confident that with the preparedness and the health systems that has been going on for a long time at this point, not just learning from what's happening now, but the other crises that we have all weathered in the past with H1N1 and similar entities that we, we feel that we can handle this together. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Franta, who's the VP of Medical Affairs for SSM. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to get our message out today to the community. 
What I would like to focus on today is the importance of calling ahead before testing. What we know is that we need to focus on containment in minimizing risk and exposure. One of the best opportunities that we have is to have patients call ahead, and this is a really important message to get out to our community. The calling ahead allows for our providers and our staff to make sure that the patient is triaged to the appropriate site of care. And that's key in getting our community members the care that they need. In addition to protecting our patients, our staff, and other patients that may be in the waiting areas or common areas, um, it allows us to prepare before the patient comes to our site for care. So if we think about the most recent example in Dane County of the patient who's presented through our system, I think this is an excellent example of how calling ahead can help us prepare. In that case, we were able to direct the patient to an alternative entrance um, so that they were not um, in the common waiting areas of our hospital. We were able to provide both the patient and our staff with the appropriate protection equipment. We were able to contact our health partners in the Department of Health to get all the preparations made for testing. And so I think this is a good example of where our early preparations have really gotten us ready um, for the patients that are starting to present to us today. And so we encourage patients to call ahead. I think we know that if patients are severely ill, or need emergency medical care, that they should continue to use the 911 system and present to our emergency rooms. But if patients either don't need care, potentially, those patients can be directed to the Department of Public Health, or if they have more mild symptoms, our nurse partners within the clinics and hospitals can help get those patients triaged in a timely fashion. Thanks so much. I'm going to pass it on now to Dr. Shirley with Meritor Hospital. Thank you, Amy. Um, my uh, task, I guess, today is to kind of go over some uh, things an individual can do to empower themselves uh, against COVID-19 uh, and actually empower their families. So um, as everybody has heard, the most important thing and the most powerful thing you could do is to wash your hands. Uh, and that sounds very simple, but um, there are special things that you should uh, do and times that you should think about doing it. Um, basically at home or, or where soap and water is available, that's the, the first advice. Um, that is the thing that is most readily available um, in most places. Uh, alternately, if uh, you need to use alcohol hand rub or that is in a, in a way better for you, uh, then that's the alternative. Uh, and essentially, uh, with soap and water, you certainly need to do it enough to cover your hands, and that usually takes 20 seconds to do a thorough job. Um, alcohol hand rub, you just need to concentrate on um, covering your hands completely and all the surfaces. Um, the times when you would wash your hands are uh, logical and um, really something to think about anyway. Uh, so instances where you, uh, after you sneeze, after you cough, after you blow your nose, uh, after you go to the bathroom. Those are all things that are, are common sense and easy to remember. Um, I think the other things to remember are, are touching your surfaces and being aware of your cell phone, those types of things as well. Um, and then I think that the, the last um, instance is, um, you know, if you're in, in public and you uh, have the ability to carry around something or find a sink to uh, wash your hands. The second most powerful general intervention you can do is to cover your cough and cover your sneeze. Um, and the classic way is to cough into your elbow, um, as everybody has seen on, in, in media. Um, and use a tissue if you sneeze um, is probably the, the, the second best thing. Um, the most difficult and hard to explain how to do this is to avoid touching your face. Uh, everybody's instinct is to do that, but I'm sure everyone has actually kind of thought about this in the, in the recent weeks. Um, and it's really just an awareness that Humans touch their face very frequently and, and to do anything you can to kind of avoid that. And along with that, um, handshakes and that type of stuff if you can um, avoid it. Um, and finally, I just wanted to mention that um, we definitely want to emphasize if you are sick or feel sick, um, it's definitely a reasonable thing to stay home. Um, you will protect yourself, other people obviously, including your family. And so if you feel sick, um, stay home, call for assistance or information if you need it. 
Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Janelle Heinrich from Public Health Madison, Dane County. Good morning. So our team at Public Health has been hard at work since January to prepare for and monitor coronavirus. As you can see, collaboration and coordination with our partners has been a key part of our shared success. And we are grateful for the ways that we have come together in our response. In early February, we identified one person with coronavirus. That person is now virus free and has recovered and is going about their daily life again. There is now a second person who has tested positive for coronavirus in Dane County. This individual recently traveled within the United States and developed symptoms shortly thereafter. They followed recommendations, as you've heard already, and called their doctor's office before visiting the doctor. We are in the process of contacting anyone who may have had contact with this person. Because of how well they followed the recommendations, there was limited possible exposure to healthcare providers and the public, and we are so grateful for everyone's care and attention in responding diligently and appropriately. While a person's chances of getting sick from coronavirus in Wisconsin are still low right now, we need to ask everyone to be a public health practitioner and advocate and to follow our recommend recommendations to prevent widespread illness in the future. We recognize that these recommendations are new and rapidly evolving. We are constantly weighing the potential benefits for community health and disease mitigation, along with the significant impacts that these recommendations could have on our community. By preparing as individuals and employees, employers, we can all limit the spread of disease, reduce the strain on our healthcare system, and keep our friends and loved ones well. Because we know of what we know about how this illness spreads, we have some general recommendations that we want to share to help prevent the spread of coronavirus in Dane County. First, you have already heard that there are many everyday prevention measures that you can take, such as staying home when you're sick, practicing hand hygiene, and cleaning or disinfecting frequently touched surfaces or objects. We are asking that you postpone or cancel non-essential travel to places with coronavirus. This includes both international and domestic um, travel where there is more widespread illness. The CDC uh, updates this information daily. If travel is essential, public health recommends a 14-day self-quarantine upon your return. The Wisconsin Department of Health Services has more information about how to self-quarantine. We know that the closer in proximity people are to each other, the more easily this virus spreads. We are recommending that those who are at higher risk for severe illness, people who are 60 and over, people with underlying health conditions, and people who are pregnant should stay home and away from large groups where there may be close contact with others as much as possible. We know that the ideal spacing to minimize risk of transmission is six feet. We are asking you as individuals and as employers to reconsider your participation in large groups, which put you or your employees in close proximity to other people. And anticipate that if this virus starts spreading more in our community, we may need to cancel mass gatherings to fit further minimize the spread of illness. We are also asking workplaces to prepare and support their employees in working from home and pro provide paid sick leave so that they are supported while they do so. Finally, think about the ways that you can change some of your habits to practice social distancing, like shopping less often and avoiding handshaking. We have more uh, information about these uh, recommendations on our Public Health Madison Dane County website. By following our guidance, we can all help protect people who are more vulnerable um, to, from the spread of this illness and the threat of this illness. The more that people take care of themselves to prevent getting sick, the less strain there will be on our hospitals and clinics. Our response to coronavirus is constantly changing as we all learn more about it, and we are staying up to date and implementing the latest guidance. Because of this, as the situation evolves, our guidance will likely evolve as well. We will continue to provide accurate, up-to-date information and guidance on our website and social media accounts to make sure you're ready and to protect people that are more vulnerable to the virus and to keep illness at bay in our community. You can also find information on the Wisconsin Department of Health Services website and on the CDC coronavirus webpage. 
Thank you for coming together as a community and rec taking the recommended steps to help prevent the spread of coronavirus in Madison and Dane County. I am particularly grateful for the support of the city, the county, the university, and healthcare leadership in role modeling the recommendations we are putting forward. Thank you. Um, thank you. Any of the speakers are available for questions. I have a question for yeah. you and for the mayor. Um, yeah. There's no such thing as too many resources in a situation like this. We would, I personally would like to see all resources brought to bear and have to not have to worry about resources. We will do what's necessary um, should this situation evolve, but the more people who are engaged, the better. I don't have anything to add. That's exactly right. Yes. Dr. Southmore, um, could you talk more specifically about how many isolation or negative air pressure rooms there are collectively in Madison hospitals and also um, how much PPE is available and which kind of PPE different healthcare workers are using based on the latest guidelines. So those guidelines, you know, if you look at the CDC website, the latest guidelines have changed as of um, yesterday or a couple of days ago, which I think gives a little bit more flexibility to how we deploy what we currently have available. There are large numbers of PPE of all different kinds. I think the question is going to be to use the right PPE for the right situation. So for example, even though our current state is that we would use an N95 respirator uh, that a healthcare worker would wear when they're taking care of a patient with suspect COVID-19, really the, the most urgent need for a respirator is when you're performing a procedure that results in aerosolization of droplets. So suctioning or bronchoscopy or something. So medical procedures that that uh, facilitate aerosolization. So there are ways that we can better use what we have available to enhance its, uh, its lifespan. The other thing that we can do now, and it's currently happening, is the following the CDC guidance on extended reuse of respirators. So there, are, there is guidance on that you don't have to immediately dispose of a respirator. This I'm speaking to specifically for healthcare workers who are using it in a healthcare system. You don't have to dispose of it immediately. You can reuse it for a certain period of time that can be that has been decided by, uh, by the health system. And so those are ways in which we preserve it. I think if there was a true surge of large numbers of patients that required ventilator support or the required ICU care, no one entity can claim at this point, I think, that we have, that we're fully prepared for that eventuality. But if there's coordination among the health systems and sharing of resources, equipment as necessary, I think that, well, that we could um, manage it. Um, at the moment, I think it's hard to say because we just have to see where this goes in terms of the volume that we expect to find, uh, but we're actively evolving our guidance as new literature becomes available. But in general, how many isolation or negative air pressure rooms are there, and do you feel like you have enough masks? I think we feel at the moment we have enough masks. It's a little bit evolving question, too, about how many negative pressure rooms because they can be, more can be created even if enough don't exist. And each health system has its own plan for dealing with that sort of capacity building. Um, I do feel that with the emerging literature surrounding what we know how this virus is transmitted, that we'll, we will be in a better position to use our PP efficiently than we have been thus far. This question is for all the uh, hospitals. Um, is there a or we've heard from many people that there is actually like mass looting of supplies from clinics, from hospitals and whatnot. Can you address that? I think it's certainly the case and it's it's not, I think, unusual that when people are um, are uncertain and afraid, it's it's a novel virus. We've never seen anything like this before. But it is important to intentionally think about what one is doing. Those masks are to be kept for people that have symptoms, which is where how the most interruption of transmission can happen. So taking away large, uh, taking away masks in bulk is not likely to serve that purpose well. Uh, it has been an issue and we've instituted ways to better deal with it to make sure that the masks reach those who need it versus somebody who may be afraid that they might need it in the future but aren't actively in need of it now. Do you have anything to add from SSM's perspective? So we've um, been taking some proactive steps to help manage our resources. Um, one of the things that we have been doing is um, keeping our masks in PPE in areas where it can be supervised um, by registration desks and, and things like that. Um, and so we've been doing that now for um, at least a week or so. And so that's kind of how we've helped manage those resources. 
Do you have facilities throughout the city and county that are senior living facilities that are health clinics that are set to serve as polling places in less than a month? Can any of the health experts speak to whether it is advisable at this point for those types of facilities to continue to act as polling places? And uh, We're proactively looking at relocating any polling places that need to be relocated. Have any been relocated as of? That's in process right now. Our clerk's office is working actively on that. So the affected voters will, will receive information about where their new polling places are as soon as we lock that down. Let, let me take the moment while we're talking about the election to encourage people, if you are able to vote absentee or uh, do early in-person absentee, um, that would certainly be recommended at this point. Um, we do not want people to be disenfranchised um, because of this virus. So we'd certainly encourage people to vote absentee or to do absentee in-person voting, which will be smaller crowds than a polling place, um, so that you don't miss your opportunity to vote in the April election. Does the mayor and the county executive, if the city or county employees have to do the quarantine at the travel or work from home, is all of that going to be paid? Uh, for the county, if, if, if an employee has to self-quarantine because of something that was encountered at work, if, if for work, if we have to work remotely, they're, they're still paid for that. If someone chooses to travel, um, as, as, you, if you, as you may have seen yesterday, I, I issued guidance that there we don't want county employees to travel any, into any states that have 10 or more cases. Um, this is a preventative effort. We need to keep our workers healthy because if there is community spread, we provide the vital services um, for everyone. So if someone does choose on their own to travel to a state that has more than, more than 10 cases, we will ask them to self-quarantine for two weeks. And if this was something that they did personally on their own, um, aside from business, they would have to use their sick or vacation time for that. We're working on similar guidance uh, for city employees, um, but again, our first priority is to make it possible for as many people who can to work from home, and that would um, continue into any quarantine period. Um, for folks who are not able to work from home, um, we will likely be in a sim similar situation as the county, but we're still working on that final guidance. And as I, s I assume the city is doing too, we are, as I mentioned, actively engaged in preparing people to be able to work from home should that need arise. If it's you know if they need extra equipment for um, working at, and their home computer, et cetera. Um, so we're at the place now where we're fortunate we have some time to prepare, and that's what we're all doing is to be as prepared as possible should community spread occur. Hopefully, many of our efforts will result in slowing that down but we believe it's prudent to be as prepared as possible in advance of any situation. So this will be for the doctors. Is this worse than H1N1 or any other <laughs> So uh, worse is relative uh, subjective, let's say, but um, I think it actually to a lot of us is reminiscent of H1N1, actually, they were going through the same similar motions and things. And if everybody remembers at that time, I think there was a lot of the upfront kind of uh, readiness preparing, a lot of activation and preparation. Um, and, you know, there was kind of a lot of uh, upfront concern uh, that was real and then kind of eventually did end. And so I think that that's how I look at it is, uh, it, it, like it was said earlier, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're um, being on the sort of ramping up and preparing stage right now. Um, so uh, I think that's actually quite similar. With UW uh, announcing that they're going to online classes, can somebody share the latest, and, and also with spring breaks coming up with a lot of K through 12 schools and people planning travels, can somebody sort of share the latest guidance for schools and when other schools might need to take similar action? So I, 
I think one of the challenges we have is there is no specific guidance that, that is universal, but the precautions are that we recommend that we start making decisions now. We are working with all of the school districts to provide them with information to support their decision making. Um, MMSD sent out messaging to request that there's not travel um, for their students or staff yesterday as well. And so that, that is what we're kind of rapidly um, working t through and looking at the CDC guidance and working with the state so that we can provide more concrete information once we get to a place where we think that that is an absolute necessary. But we pr appreciate the fact that folks are starting to make those decisions now because the more we can prepare for that and not go to places where there, are, there is more illness, the less likely we are to bring that back here and then to, to support that spread in our community. And, and the reason it's not more yet is because we don't have community spread here yet? We do not have community spread yet. And that's the reason why the guidance isn't stronger yet? That's correct. What, what about large gathering places in Madison and Bay County, like the state capital or you know, places where a lot of people are mm -hmm. gathering every day? So that is where we're, we're recommending that folks, if you are in these um, categories which put you at a higher risk for becoming ill, that we're asking you to um, make decisions for yourself to not be in places where you're in cl close proximity to each other. Similar to the community spread, we need to prepare for when we may not be able to do that because we have more illness here. But there is no current recommendation that those things need to stop immediately. What about the events where there will be people coming in, potentially from places where there's been community transmission? Yeah. There will, about two months, Epic is having its right. big conference. Uh, what, if any, is guidance with regard to those types of events? Right. As of right now, similar to what we're asking for our Dane County residents who have traveled to places um, where there is more illness to self-quarantine for 14 days, we're making that recommendation that it's not just if that was your, your uh, vacation spot but if that was your home place and you're coming here you would do that and that could have an impact on at, at present given that guidance on future gatherings and I am aware that there are you know organizations are taking it upon themselves to start making decisions in preparation for um, the future. Would that mean organizations perhaps advise visitors coming from a place with community transmission to perhaps reconsider Correct. having those particular guests uh, yes. coming? Mm -hmm. Is community spread inevitable, or if we follow these guidelines, we could avoid that? I think we'd like to say it's inevitable, but I think that it's likely that it will happen here. And I think what we are trying to make sure that we are doing is that we are minimizing that risk for um, how, it could, uh, c how it could spread in our community. Are either of the hospitals, um, are either of you guys concerned that anyone who's worked with the patients in the past uh, that have had it have also caught the, caught the virus? Sure. So I can talk about Thank you. So I can talk a little bit just about kind of our specific case that um, any of the staff who have been in contact with the patient in that we know of in Dane County that is positive, we take, um, again, really proactive staffs. St we take proactive steps to monitor those staff um, and to have our employee health work with those um, staff members for monitoring of symptoms on a daily basis. And so um, I would say because we felt like we had great practices right off the, the get-go with all the necessary precautions that our risk of transmission to staff is really low. Um, but of course, we encourage the, the monitoring period after any exposure to known patients. And I think we can kind of make the same extrapolation to some of the other patients that have been under investigation that the hospitals are really taking steps to assure that they're staff are safe, they're using the right equipment, they're minimizing risk and exposure. Um, and, and so we like to feel like our staff are in, in good hands with the precautions we put forward. Just quickly, I've heard the monitoring of staff includes taking the temperature twice a day. Is that what you're doing or are you doing other things? So yes, yeah, so the monitoring includes temperatures twice a day, but it also includes monitoring for symptoms. Um, which is which seems kind of straightforward, but um, that can be fever, cough, anything that seems out of the ordinary for our staff members. Other questions? Again, um, please check 
um, Public Health Madison Dane County's social media often. They will continue to update folks. We will continue to update um, periodically and as needed. Uh, we want to make sure that people know that there is coordination going on. Look at the units of government are communicating. Um, our emergency services are communicating. We're working with our health care systems, with our schools, and, and all of the people um, who need to be involved in this are talking and coordinating our efforts, and we know that prevention is the best medicine. Uh, we want to do everything we can to get out ahead of this and to keep as many people safe as possible, safe from, from getting the virus, and do all, everything within our power to uh, manage the situation in an appropriate manner. Thank you all for coming. Thanks.